Thank you. you. May be seated. The precious name of Jesus, the Lamb of God, God's Passover Lamb. Passover ended last night with the going down of the sun. But the real Passover never ends. Please take your Bibles and turn with me back to Exodus, if you will. We're in Exodus chapter 13. We're looking at verses 1 through 16. Now, last week, we sort of tried to get back on track, summarizing everything after all those special events that we had for many weeks in a row, all the way from uh, Palm Sunday. We had lots of specials going on. So we're back now to our thinking in the book of Exodus. And we saw that the foundational truth underlying the sanctification of the firstborn, which is what we're talking about in Exodus chapter 13 right now, that the underlying truth for that entire section is what's called the law of harvest. God always makes the law of harvest, we saw, apply in five specific areas. The law of harvest applies to our actions, to our thoughts, to our words, to our motives, and to our attitudes. God is testing what you sow in every one of those areas. You might say, well, my, my words are okay. You know, I, I never say anything wrong, but what are your attitudes when you say it? What are your motivations behind what you say? What are the thoughts that are running through your mind when it comes out of your mouth? You say, oh dearie, I just love your purse. When you think, that is the ugliest purse I ever saw in my life. <laughs> you get the idea. Five areas where the law of harvest applies. We also saw that there are seven principal applications in each of those five areas which gives a minimum total of 35 different possible combinations. Remember what we saw down in verses 35 and 36 of chapter 12? The children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. They borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required. And they spoiled the Egyptians. The children of Israel had worked as slaves for 400 years in Egypt after there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, and they had not been paid fair wages. And we noted the very basic principle last week that God doesn't tolerate it when the world treats his people that way. All over the world today, there are Christians who are being treated poorly, some being abused, some being tortured, some being imprisoned, some being killed. God will not tolerate that, and there will come a payday someday. But we need to remember, too, that God doesn't tolerate it when Christians treat other Christians that way. God doesn't tolerate it when Christian employers treat their employees that way, with haughty arrogance, oppression, and minimal wages for their work. God doesn't tolerate it when Christian husbands treat their wives and children that way. God doesn't tolerate it when churches treat their pastors that way. God opposed Egypt for failing to, failing to pay the Jews a fair wage. He not only paid the Jews their fair wages in those two verses I just read to you, but he paid the Egyptians, too, some wages. Remember, the wages of sin is death. He paid the Egyptians their fair wages in sending the ten plagues, not to mention the fact that he exacted from those Egyptians that immense amount of wealth the night of the Passover. The seven key principles of the harvest, when multiplied by five, we see 35 at least, here are the seven key principles of the law of harvest in a nutshell. The kind of crop you sow is the kind of crop you reap. The season in which you sow determines the season in which you will reap. The amount that you sow determines the amount that you will reap. The location in which you sow determines the location in which you reap. The realm in which you sow determines the realm in which you reap. The people with whom you sow determines the people with whom you reap. For example, your children. The quality of the crop that you sow determines the quality of the crop that you will reap. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. As a side note, we noted that 
there in that passage in Galatians, which I just quoted one verse of, it says that we are to do good unto all men, especially them that are of the household of faith. And I pointed out last week that that little word translated especially is the Greek word malista. It's a defining word to more precisely focus in on what the author is talking about. We use that word or a phrase like that in English when we use the phrase, by that we mean to say. So therefore let us do good to all men, by that I mean to say, unto them who are of the household of faith. Christians have a very special responsibility in being a benefit and blessing to other Christians. It's not a do-gooder verse where you go out and you know, help little old ladies across the street indiscriminately, although there's a place for that. But this verse is talking about our responsibility as believers to other believers. We pointed out that the law of harvest is related to works. It's not related to grace. The grace of God can break into the law of harvest and save us in spite of our evil ways, and he often does. But that does not give us license to abuse the grace of God just because God is able to break into the cycle of destruction. Grace is not a license to commit sin, but the supernatural ability to overcome sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. We saw last week, finally, that the law of harvest is the basis for legal judgment. That is the judgment of works. And we saw that is true not only in time present, but we saw that is true when we reach the culmination of all things, when we move into the eschatological future, the prophetic future of things to come. In Revelation chapter 20, we find that when the dead are raised, they are judged according to their works, and they are all thrown, because these are those who did not trust Christ. All the unbelievers are judged according to their works. And those who are not found written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. There are serious implications for the way in which we live our lives and the things that we believe. There is a harvest that comes as a result of what we have done. In the temporal realm, there will be a temporal harvest. In the eternal realm, there will be an eternal harvest. In the temporal realm, we saw some of that playing out here now as God is about to take the children of Israel out of Egypt, lead them across the Red Sea, and eventually, after 40 years of wandering because they belly ached so much, eventually get them into the promised land. Yes, we see the law of harvest at work in the wilderness wanderings too. They get paid back for what they complain about God. You complain about God. You know, when you complain about certain things, you're really complaining about what God has done. We serve a sovereign God. You complain about your health. God is the one who can change your health from good to bad or bad to good. You complain about the money that you've got. You wish you had more. You know, the Bible tells us that God can take our resources and blow on them and they're gone. Do you complain about your looks or your talents? Moses did, and what did God say to him? Moses, who made man's tongue? Do you not realize you're complaining against God himself? when you think you're not as handsome as somebody else or not as beautiful as somebody else or not as talented as somebody else or not as rich as somebody else? Who is it in his sovereign plan at this point in history chose to put you here as a key player on his team and for his glory, not for his shame? We need to remember Jesus said so in Matthew 13. Every idle word of men that they shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Every one, none are skipped. Every idle word. Someday Jesus will say to us, Why did you say that? Well, Lord, 
I guess that was sinful. You guess? It was sinful. Law of harvest. That's the basis for legal judgment. How thankful we are for the grace of God. And that brought us to the key verse in our text, Exodus 13, 1 and 2. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast. It is mine. We saw some outstanding things in this passage, things that really, really, if you stop and think about it for a minute, jump right out of the text at you. As you look at those verses, because this is before they are celebrating Passover, the first 16 verses of chapter 13 describe once again very precisely what must be done at, by every Jew at every Passover. That's why they're still doing it. That's why this whole past week was Passover week. They're still doing it 3,450 years after the first one was instituted. And Jews all over the world are doing it. Did you saw what had to happen first? The sanctification of the firstborn comes first. The Passover couldn't even be started unless the firstborn were set apart first to God. When they ended it last night, they were ending it all over the world. As each time zone went by and the first star appeared for the Jews in that time zone, Passover ended. And so it was a continuous ending as the earth revolved around the sun until it was completely over. But that was sundown in each time zone of the Gentile world. And did you notice that they were supposed to end it in those time zones? You say, where's that? Look at verse 11. It shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every first thing that cometh out of the beast which thou hast, the male shall be the Lord's, and every first thing of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among the children shalt thou redeem. When thou comest to the land of the Canaanites, that's the pagans. And the Jews have been brought to all the lands of the Canaanites, all the lands of the pagans, all around the world. And their obligation is to give the firstborn to the Lord, to redeem it with a lamb. God is teaching some incredible, powerful prophetic truths in this. Setting apart the firstborn, giving it to the Lord was to remind them that God killed the firstborn in Egypt. God killed them. This dramatic reenactment was a sober reminder to each oldest child that he would have been dead were it not for the shed blood of the lamb. The oldest child is the one that carries on the family name, the family heritage, the family tradition, the birthright, the paternal blessing, the patriarchal authority, the double inheritance, and many other things in the Old Testament. All of that would have been cut off except for the Passover lamb. I said last week that should scare the socks off of every firstborn. God started by killing off the top, the cream of the crop, the beginning of the family. But God made provision for redeeming the firstborn through the blood of the Lamb. And that's why at every Passover Seder, the head of the table tells the children why they are doing this. Unlike, unfortunately, Christmas in many of the Christian homes across this country and around the world, where the focus is not on Jesus, it's on Santa Claus, or at, quote, Easter, where the focus is on running around finding Easter eggs and getting baskets with chocolate bunnies and very bad tasting little peeps, those puffy little things made out of marshmallows. Instead of focusing on why we do this, why do we do this? 
Thou shalt be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this that thou shalt say unto him? By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. Dear people, God gives us historical events in Scripture that we might teach our children why we do what we do. Let me show you some things here. <clears throat> Throughout the Old Testament, there is a striking emphasis on the firstborn. You may have picked up on that, maybe not. But the firstborn is emphasized over and over and over in almost every book of the Old Testament. There's a reason for that. You see, the firstborn is the beginning of the strength of a man's family. This is seen clearly in the prophetic words of Jacob on his deathbed and later in the specific laws related to the children born of more than one wife. For example, here's Jacob on his deathbed. Genesis 49, and those of you who were with us when we went through the book of Genesis, know that Genesis 49 are the prophetic blessings that Jacob places on each of his sons on the 12 tribes of Israel to tell what will happen in the latter days in relation to each one of those tribes. Genesis 49. Jacob's firstborn was a man by the name of Reuben. Genesis 49.3, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. That verse defines for you how Israel was to view the firstborn. And God killed the firstborn in Egypt. And as the Jews remind their sons at every Passover, if our fathers had not put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, the firstborn would be dead. Without the blood of the Passover, you, my son, my firstborn, would be dead. My firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, the excellency of power. You know, a man couldn't choose between which sons he liked better if one was born of a beloved wife and one was born of a wife that he didn't like quite as much. It's given to us in the law, Deuteronomy 21.15. If a man have two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. And if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Sanctify unto me, says God, the firstborn. So let me ask a question. Are you a firstborn, whether male or female? Are you a firstborn? Are you the beginning of your father's strength? You say, man, we can get off this because there are only girls in our families. Well, there are at least three families in this church that have all girls, all daughters, so what about families like that who have no firstborn sons? Provision was made under the Old Testament law for daughters to receive the blessing and inheritance of the firstborn where there were no sons born in the family. You can't get out of it, girls. There's a lot of responsibility that rests on the shoulders of the firstborn child in every family. And God made a point of that when he divided up the land inheritance to Israel. Numbers chapter 26, verse 33, we read, And Zelophehad, the son of Hepher, had no sons but daughters. And the names of the daughters of Zelophehad were Mala and Noah, 
Hogla, Milka, and Tirza. Chapter 27, Numbers, verse 1. Then came the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these are the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirzah. And they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the princes of all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, and he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin and had no sons. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his brethren because he had no son? Give unto us therefore possession among the brethren of our father. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad speak right. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren, and thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. And if he has no daughter, ye, then you shall give his inheritance unto his brethren. If he has no brethren, then you shall give his inheritance unto his father's brethren. And if his father have no brethren, then you shall give his inheritance unto the kinsman that is next to him of his family, and he shall possess it, and it shall be unto the children of Israel a statute of judgment, as the Lord commanded Moses. Girls, God cares about you too. A whole lot. Now, there's a reason for me telling you this. I love to look at every scripture passage, every truth in its context. I don't know if you're over there in Numbers 27 right now. I just read you through verse 11. It's fascinating to notice that this set of commands concerning daughters is the very last thing that God commanded Moses before he told Moses to climb the mountain, see the promised land, and die before Israel entered into it. The very last thing he told him. Verse 12 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mount Abarim, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother was gathered. For ye rebelled at my commandment in the desert of Zin, in the strife of the congregation, to sanctify me at the waters before their eyes, that is the water of Merbah, in Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin. That's when Moses was told on the second occasion, when the people of Israel had no water. First time, he, God told him to strike the rock. He struck the rock, and water came out. Second time, God said, Speak to the rock! And Moses was so sick and tired, he'd been leading these people for 40 years, and all they did was gripe and bellyache and mumble and complain and groan and moan and try to kill him on various occasions and want to get rid of him and go back to Egypt and all the leeks and lentils and all the pleasures they thought they remembered in Egypt while they were slaves. And Moses was fed up over his eyeballs with tiredness at their complaints. And God said, speak to the rock. And Moses said, What, ye rebels? And he took his rod. Must we bring you forth water out of the rock? Whack! He hit it the second time. And God in his grace let water come out. But he said to Moses, Because you have not sanctified me in the eyes of the people, therefore you will see the land. But you shall not enter therein. Think of that. Forty years in Egypt. Forty years back out in the desert as a shepherd. Forty years leading the children of Israel to the border of the promised land. A hundred and twenty years. And one mistake meant that he didn't get to go in. Paul tells us why, 1 Corinthians 10. Because he tells us that the rock that followed them was Christ. The one out of whose belly pours living waters, Jesus said. Just like the waters in the desert providing for God's people. And Jesus was smitten only 
once. And then all we have to do is come to him and ask. He doesn't have to be smitten a second time. Paul tells us those things were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. How little actions change the course of our futures, determine our blessings or our withholding of blessings. We're going to see that in relation to firstborn. It's a very important principle as we discover many wicked firstborn who lose their inheritance in the Old Testament. To emphasize that point of privilege and responsibility, the daughters of Zelophehad are mentioned six more times in Numbers, Joshua, and First Chronicles. I won't read all of those to you, but Numbers chapter 36, verse 2, verse 6, verse 10 and 11, Joshua 17, 13, Joshua 17, 4, First Chronicles 7, 15. God wanted to make sure that wasn't forgotten. So firstborn daughters also had certain privileges. In one case, we see in the Old Testament, it was the first right of marriage. You know the story, Genesis 29. Jacob thinks he's been working for Rachel all those years. Uh, they have the big wedding night party, and he probably was a little bit tipsy after the party. He goes in and wakes up in the morning, discovers it's not Rachel, it's Leah. And then he comes out and complains about it. And Laban said, it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. <laughs> the firstborn daughter had some rights too. What's the point of the discussion? Daughters are valuable in the eyes of God as well as sons. And that is far different than the pagan nations of the world. The term firstborn is found exactly 100 times in the King James Bible. 100 times. Only seven of those occurrences are found in the New Testament. 93 in the Old Testament, seven in the New Testament. Six of those seven in the New Testament refer to Christ. Interesting. Two of them refer to the physical firstborn son of Mary. Four refer to his position in relationship to God the Father. And only one related to the actual firstborn slain or redeemed at the first Passover. Interesting. The Old Testament Passover firstborn is tied in and all six other references are to Jesus. You begin to understand why God says, Sanctify unto me the firstborn. He's telling us something about Jesus. We find the physical occurrences in Matthew 1.25 and Luke 2.7. Joseph knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Luke 2.7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And now we find the theological references pointing to Jesus as the firstborn. Romans 8.29 For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he, that is the son, might be the firstborn among the brethren. The one with all the extra rights, all the one that extras privileges, the one that has a double inheritance, all those fantastic things, they're portrayed for us in the firstborn of the Old Testament. Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the invisible God, that is Jesus, the firstborn of every creature. He has the double right because he is the creator. Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. People were raised from the dead before this, but they died again. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, and that he will never again die. Hebrews 11.28 And here we find the one reference that ties us back to Passover. Through faith... He kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And then Hebrews chapter 12, uh, looking into the future. 
to the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn. That's us, people. We're the Church of the Firstborn. Jesus is our firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. I hope you see in just a minute that Jesus is called firstborn in the New Testament many times in light of one specific thing. In light of all the wicked firstborn sons of the Old Testament, they were all four firstborn sons who forfeited their rights and their inheritance. Jesus is the firstborn son who regained the rights of inheritance and passed them on to us, his brethren. It's of interest that the very firstborn son born in the Bible, Cain, is not called by the term firstborn, even though, in fact, he was the firstborn. And he was a wicked son. In that same vein, it's significant to notice that the very first occurrence of the term firstborn in the Old Testament is used of the wicked son of a man that God cursed. Did you know that Canaan, the father of the Canaanites, was the son of Ham? And it was Canaan, not Ham, it was Canaan whom God cursed when Ham saw his father naked and thought that it was funny. Genesis 9, verse 20. Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his younger son had done unto him, and said, did he say, cursed be Ham? No, he didn't say that, did he? What did he say? He said, cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. We're told about Canaan's descendants in chapter 10. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mitzrayim, Phut, and Canaan. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn. You know, you've heard of Tyre and Sidon, I'm sure. You've heard about Sidon and Jezebel. And Baal. Jezebel's father, king of Sidon. And Heth, that's the Hittites, some of the most filthy people in the ancient world. And afterward, the fam families of the Canaanites were spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest, unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboim, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. Ever heard of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim? There was a fifth city of the plain also, Zoar. That's where Lot ended up going. Those five were the cities of the plain that God saw as so filthy and so wicked because of their homosexuality, to use the clinical term, their sodomy. But he rained fire and brimstone from heaven and burned them up. Let's look at another firstborn son. Our time's almost up. Reuben, the firstborn son of Jacob, was also a wicked son. We mentioned him just a minute ago. Jacob defines for us what the blessings of a firstborn son would be if he were righteous. Reuben, the firstborn son of Jacob, was a wicked son. God removed the privilege of the firstborn from him because he committed incest with his father's wife. That's also a sin, by the way, cursed in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 5. Listen to Genesis 35:22. It came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben, there's the firstborn son, went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. We talked about the prophetic blessings in Genesis 49. Reuben's one pleasure splurge brought the permanent loss of the rights of the firstborn. When Jacob prophetically blessed each of the tribes that would descend from his sons, he cursed Reuben. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. Then defiledst thou it, he went up to my couch. How would you like to have that as your father's final blessing? All the children are gathered around. Your father is passing out blessings, and he looks at you and he says, you're under my curse. Serious? Yes. And it goes all the way through history. 
Even though he had the rights of the firstborn, Reuben was cursed when the eternal blessings were passed out to the tribes. This is a clear illustration in the Old Testament how God's blessings and inheritance can be lost even while still remaining part of God's chosen people. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your inheritance. You can lose your blessings. Esau is another example of this principle who is given to us as a warning not to treat the blessings of God lightly, to satisfy the flesh. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 14, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently. Is this something you better pay attention to? Lest any man fail of the grace of God. God always gives grace to resist temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Oh, and here we find an attitude that starts, that ultimately leads to sin. Is this attitude anywhere in your life? Be sure you pull it out by the roots. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. And what's the next thing he mentions after that root of bitterness? Fornication. Sexual immorality. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat What do you get? Bean soup? A bowl of porridge? Pottage? For one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward Esau was the firstborn. Esau would have had it all. All the blessings. Think of how history would have been different if the progenitor of the Hebrew race have been Esau and not Jacob. Who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know, now he was sorry about it later. He really was. It says, for you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Dear people, sin does not pay except one form of wages, death. I hope you notice that sexual immorality is given as an illustration of something that you can do that can never be undone. An act that has permanent consequences no matter how badly you want to reverse it. You lose something and you lose blessings that you can never regain again. Young people and older people, keep yourselves pure. Well, our time is up. I have a couple more things we need to say about Reuben because Reuben really tried hard to make things right. He did a bunch of things that were really, really right. But on that area, it was too late. Lord willing, we'll pick it up again there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. You've given it to us because you love us. You want to warn us. You want to keep us from that which is evil. You want to protect us. It's not because you don't want us to have fun. It's because you know the damaging consequences of sin. You've made us. You've made us in a very special way. Oh, Father, help us to be wise and to learn that from your word, not having to learn it through the painful experience of life. Help us to know, Father, that you are a God who keeps his promises, who has blessings that are immeasurable, unfathomable. But because you are righteous, you have tied certain loss of blessings and inheritances to those who reject your word, those who mock your word, those who scorn your word, those who disobey your word. Father, help us to understand. Then help us to believe and help us to obey. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 305, 305, Jesus.